This is a podcast from the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. I am Peter Kergart. I'm a visiting fellow at the Leverhulme Centre for Human Evolutionary Studies. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Philosophy and History of Ideas at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. We usually think of the, the Origin of Species as a hugely popular book. Well, it was in a sense it sold out quite quickly. It came out in several editions, but still it was only a matter of a few thousand copies, which meant that a lot of people who learned about Darwin didn't do that from a first-hand experience of reading of the Origin of Species. Instead, what they did was reading about Darwin in popular magazines, from newspaper articles, from periodicals, from lectures, in all sorts of ways. So they weren't reading Darwin himself. One of the things that made Darwin so successful in terms of people knowing about his ideas was that he gave people something to talk about and that his ideas could be communicated through all these new means of communication that we saw rising in the late 19th century. We usually think about Darwin in terms of texts, in terms of ideas communicated through words, but what was important in the same period was that the printing technology made a lot of cheap reproduction of images and visual communication available to a a very large audience. And another reason for the success of the dissemination or the spread of knowledge about Darwin was that it was communicating through images of all sorts, images of our ancestors or our relatives, or images of apes and eventually of the missing link, which was something that was particularly famous and particularly striking and one of the most fascinating icons of evolution very early on from the 1860s where the missing link was used as a a catchphrase that was used by anyone. Everybody knew what it, it was about, that it was the link connecting the human race with our closest relatives or ape like ancestors. And it was taken seriously by everyone. But it was also something that was feeding the public imagination and we saw consequently a lot of images about ape-like ancestors, ape-like links, most of them generated fear and anxiety that could this really be the case that we should be related to such creatures, but also curiosity and fascination. So the highly visual character of the theory of evolution played an important part in the success of the dissemination of the theory of Anne of Darwin. Still today, the missing link is one of the the most powerful icons of the theory of evolution. We all know what the missing link is, what it's about still today. It doesn't have any scientific relevance at all. We don't think of the missing link as uh, something that is a scientific problem. But yet, it's something that we still, in popular circles, are referring to, especially in anti-evolutionist circles. The missing link is still seen as one of the major problems that the theory of evolution suffers. My research is about the origin of the missing link and the tremendous popularity that this catchphrase had from around the time of the publication of The Origin of Species until well into the 20th century when the search for the missing link ceased to be a scientific problem. People were going out looking for the missing link and something that would give people eternal fame, scientific fame. The image of the missing link was clearly related to monkeys and apes, which now appeared in Europe for the first time. People really didn't know how monkeys looked like or how how the big apes looked like. People have seen some images and read about people meeting gorillas in Africa, seeing orangutans and so forth. But in the 19th century, the big apes and monkeys were now brought to Europe at zoological gardens and in menageries, travelling all around Europe, displaying these creatures and the missing link, our relatives. They were clearly related to the experience of the apes and monkeys that people saw for the first time now in Europe. So some of the missing links that we saw portrayed were, for instance, bearded women, very hairy creatures that were being produced as proofs and on tour all around Europe. But also a lot of people were using, for instance, chimpanzees to demonstrate that these were actually the missing links. You could you could see them because they were so human-like and displaying them as the missing links. 
One example is the director of the Zoological Garden in Copenhagen, who was a great fan of Darwin and was so absolutely certain about the theory of evolution by natural selection and the consequences it had for human evolution that he was very keen on giving the living missing link to uh, the people of Copenhagen in the shape of a male chimpanzee, which he made dress up, sit by a dinner table, eating with knife and fork, and after it had taken its meal, he had the chimpanzee riding around the park on a bicycle, demonstrating that this was a very human-like creature, that it was absolutely nothing to worry about, and this was the missing link. In fact, he was so certain about this that he called the chimpanzee Master Link. The history of the missing link shows us how Darwin's ideas were inspiring people to communicate their own ideas about the natural world in all sorts of ways and making them fit specific cultural agendas, national agendas. That was also what happened when we look at how Darwin's ideas were communicated from Britain and throughout Europe. Even when we look at the reception of Darwinism in Britain, there were very big differences in how the theory of evolution was interpreted and what people were emphasising. What we've been talking about in terms of how Darwin's ideas were communicated was also reflected in the ways that it was received in the rest of Europe. It was communicated through translations, but a lot of these translations were reflecting translators' own ideas about the natural world and about how we should understand it. On the Origin of Species was given new titles in different languages and was clearly reflecting the ideas that people had in France, where Darwin was seen not as this person who gave us an entirely new view on life on Earth, but as yet another who was trying to understand the natural world. And in France, Lamarck was a completely different currency, and Darwin was seen in the context of the understanding of evolution that was already prevalent in France. Same thing happened in Germany, where Darwin's ideas were appropriated and famously communicated by Ernst Haeckel and given a spin directly linking Darwinism to atheism. And that sort of interpretation, the German atheistic interpretation of Darwinism, was what was being communicated to Scandinavia. So when Darwinism came to Scandinavia, it was through the German sources that people were reading. At that time, English was not the common language that everybody was speaking in the Scandinavian countries. People were reading and speaking German. They were reading French. So the sources that people were using were not the British sources, which clearly influenced the way people were talking about Darwinism, which was also one of the reasons why people reacted against Darwinism and used Darwin as something that was clearly related to not just a view of nature but also a view of God and how we should structure the intellectual world and ideas about science, society and all these ideas came through the German sources and had a great influence on how people were thinking in the Scandinavian countries. So curiously what we see is that uh, first wave of Darwinism in Scandinavia where Darwin's ideas were embraced was then obviously producing a reaction from religious circles against Darwinism and against evolution. By the end of the century and uh, the early part of the 20th century, Darwin was taken in and could be taken in because he was uh, now being appropriated by a new religious group who were were trying to accommodate science and scientific naturalism and could do so because they could blame the connection between atheism and evolution on the Germans, blame that on Ernst Haeckel, and instead take Darwin in as this friendly British gentleman naturalist uh, that no one had to be afraid of. What we see in the beginning of the 20th century is that a lot of religious groups are appropriating Darwin's ideas for pursuing specific agendas, especially the idea that human evolution was something that contradicted human creation. We saw that in particular in America, and the creationist movement grew out of America. When we look at the situation today, nothing much has changed really. There are absolutely no scientific 
evidence that supports the creationists or for the people from the intelligent design movement. Also, all the arguments that they're, they're making are at least 200 years old. Also, the way of appropriating all available technologies in order to communicate their ideas and their agendas haven't really changed. At the beginning of the 20th century, the creationists, they were using both the legal system as they did in the United States. They were using newspapers, they were using lectures, and they were using the radio in order to communicate their agenda. And what we see today is that they're using in exactly the same way all the available technologies and they have very successfully conquered the internet. Everywhere you look on the internet for information about evolution, for information about Darwin, you'll find links to creationists' websites or intelligent design websites. And even though they have no scientific evidence, even though they're not producing anything that could persuade people that the theory of evolution is resting on a loose foundation, all these arguments are just rhetoric and have nothing but rhetorical function. But yet, the way that uh, creationists have been appropriating the internet, they've actually been quite successful in a way that we have not realised up till very recently. A great surprise was uh, at the beginning of 2009 when there was a poll which was published in The Guardian about how many people in Britain believed in evolution or thought that the theory of evolution by natural selection was a correct theory. And quite surprisingly, the number had dropped from four or five years ago down to about only 50% of the British population. And in fact, just 25% of the British population now believes that uh, the theory of evolution is correct. 25% believes that it's correct, but also thinks that we need to include something else, which is quite surprising. And obviously what we have to do is to look into reasons why this could be the case. One of the reasons we see, and one of the things that has changed over the past five years, is that the creationists are now using the internet are, and are visible uh, on the internet and are providing a lot of so-called information that you would find when you're going out looking as a school child and doing assignments, you'll stumble across these creationist websites. And many of them are looking like they are providing genuine scientific uh, information about how it looks like. One example is that in February, when you were searching for the word evolution on the Guardian's website, you'd get a series of sponsored links. They're all in the same design as the Guardian's website, and they look like trustworthy information. But the problem was that some of the sponsored links were linking directly to creationist websites. And obviously, if you were a school teacher and you were giving children an assignment on evolution and uh, you were asking, so which website are you looking at? I'm looking at the Guardian's website. You'd think that's perfectly fine, that's safe, it's, it's all right, and not realising that you're actually going straight into creationist websites. And ultimately also... Web polls have been hijacked by creationists all over Europe in European media. And what happens is that large networks of people, whenever they discover one of these web polls, they send people in voting, which means that they are overnight changing the opinion, apparently, of people voting on these uh, websites. And it's usually a question, do you believe that people descend from apes, yes or no? Do you believe that the world was created by God, yes or no? And invariably, all these web polls have been manipulated. So it looks as though the population of Europe, that's about between 80 or 90 percent, that they now reject the theory of evolution. And when you have school children looking at the German newspaper develops website and you say that it's perfectly okay and the children, they're safe in this environment, but they're not because this material has been manipulated and these newspapers, they don't discover it. They don't see their web polls as anything but a very nice way of uh, engaging the readers and keeping them uh, at the website and keep them coming back. So what we find here is that the creationists have been very successful in creating a wrong image that people are now beginning to believe in and that school children are now be- beginning to believe in that of course, it's true. The theory of evolution is resting on the, on the loose foundation. A lot of people, 80% of people in Germany are now re- rejecting evolution. 90% of people in France are now rejecting the theory of evolution. Of course, it's, it's really something that's, uh, that has made an impact. Of course, they believe in this because it's in these trustworthy media. And that's a problem. That's something that we need to take seriously. And we need to educate our children in how 
the internet is being manipulated and in being more critical of the information that they find on the internet and ultimately also making certain that we are giving them trustworthy information about evolution, about science, from trustworthy scientific organisations.